history tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 129th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And on today's episode, we're bringing you another life and afterlife of a certain individual famous in history. Today, that is Geronimo. Before we do that, we want you to check out our website, historyghostbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us some email, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. We do want to announce the winner for the May 2016 exclusive t-shirt drawing, and that is Robert Geisel or Giesel. I'm not sure how to pronounce that last name, but congratulations. Yes, congratulations, Robert. So just send us your address and t-shirt size at historygoesbump at gmail.com, and we will get that sent out to you. We want to thank Cassia and also Zach for some great suggestions on locations in Oregon and Alabama. Elizabeth left us a message on our website. I just recently found the podcast surfing through iTunes while at work and I cannot stop listening. Thank you both so much for making my workday more enjoyable. I love it. And she's a Kentucky native and she said she was wondering about us doing a podcast on Waverly Hills or Bobby Mackey's and I let her know that we did mention Waverly Hills on the Louisville road trip so we haven't done a full look at that but uh, eventually we'll probably dedicate an entire episode to it. It's just one of those really popular places that I wanted to get into some more lesser known type areas. But we did talk a bit about it on the Louisville road trip. We even tried to get up to see it, but mm, to no avail. Unfortunately, it was closed by the time we got to the gate, so we couldn't get up and do a little tour of it. So one day we will do it. But not at night. (laughs) No. And then we also received a message from Heather Don on Winter Kitchens. I'm listening to Octagon Hall podcast, listening to your podcast backwards. I'm from the South and we have several plantations near us. Most of the time, kitchens are in a separate building away from the house. This keeps the house safe from fires in the kitchen and keeps the heat from the kitchen out of the house. Kentucky is colder than we are in Louisiana, so they have winter kitchens to help warm the house during their cold winters. And we heard from Angela Santos on the fan page. Great show, ladies. I've got a few episodes to go to catch up. Currently listening to episode 52. I'll get there. You do a fantastic job. Thanks so much, Angela, for letting us know that. And we want to welcome to the spectacular crew, Kendall. Hey, Kendall. Marzio. Hi, Marzio. Susan. Hey, Susan. Linda. Hi, Linda. Kimberly. Hi, Kimberly. And Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. All right, Denise, are you ready to share the life and afterlife of Geronimo with everyone? I most certainly am. All right, let's do it. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to this moment in oddity. And this moment in oddity is brought to us by Bob Sherfield. The last thing one expects to find while driving through rural Alabama is a full-scale replica of Stonehenge. If you should find yourself on US-98 heading out of Pensacola, Florida, Take the time for a small diversion through the wooded countryside where you will find a clearing in the trees. In that clearing stands Bama Hedge. The brainchild of Alabama billionaire George Barber, the structure is a full-size replica of the original standing in at 21 feet tall and 104 feet wide. It is orientated to the summer solstice with the sun rising over the center of three lintels on the outer markers. Strangely, Bama Hinge is constructed of fiberglass, 
and reinforced with concrete and telegraph poles. The stones include four different designs of stone, but by cleverly flipping, rotating, and repositioning each one, the illusion that they are all different has been created. Many who visit the site are surprised to find out that the structure isn't made of stone. They wrap their knuckles against the slabs only to find they aren't made of rock. Why was it built here, and why was it built, are questions that only the creator of the structure can answer. One thing we do know, a fiberglass replica of Stonehenge certainly is odd. Scared yet? Boo! <laughs> This Day in History And This Day in History is by Stephen Pappas. On this day, June 8th in 1949, the FBI released a report naming multiple Hollywood personalities as communists. Among the named personalities were Frederick March, Paul Minnie, and Edward G. Robinson. Following the Second World War, America saw the rise of communism as a new threat, and a hysteria set in that led into the Cold War period of U.S. history. Most of the accusations were tips from so-called reliable sources, stating the actors, actresses, and directors were involved in the Communist Party. During this time, the government theorized that Hollywood was packed with communists who were using films and song to spread the Red Agenda. Many senators, the most infamous of which would become Joseph McCarthy, believed that it fell to them to hunt out the communists in Hollywood and seek to stop their influence. These events would even go on to inspire playwright Arthur Miller to create one of his most famous works, The Crucible. After the allegations were leveled, Edward G. Robinson was quoted as having said, These rantings, ravings, accusations, smearing, and character assassinations can only emanate from sick, diseased minds of people who rush to the press with indictments of good American citizens. I've played many parts in my life, but no part have I played better or been more proud of than that of being an American citizen. History Goes Bump Podcast. The Apache warrior Geronimo is a legend, but he was once just a man who had a family. The death of his loved ones at the hands of the Mexicans pushed Geronimo into becoming a fighter. The Anglos would constrict the Apache way of life, and Geronimo would retaliate in ways that would embarrass the U.S. government. He escaped capture time and again. Eventually, he would surrender, and then he would become a celebrity in captivity as he was ushered to world fairs and Western shows. Such an enduring spirit could not be snuffed out by death. Reports abound from many different locations that Geronimo's apparition has been seen and his spirit has been felt. Join us as we explore the life and afterlife of Geronimo. The Apache native people are made up of six subgroups pertaining to the region where they had lived. They came from the north and settled in the plains and southwest. And it's this southwest area that they would be moved from. And Geronimo is going to try, basically for the entire adult part of his life, to get his people back to the southwest. The first mention of these peoples was in 1598. They were known as nomads following the trail of the buffalo, which was their main form of sustenance. They considered eating fish and bear taboo. They would also hunt deer and occasionally they would plant things, Denise, but they were really not known as agriculturalists. They were mostly hunter-gatherers, so if they found berries and such, they would eat that. The other main attribute of the Apache were their warlike nature. They were raiders of both the white man and other native tribes. This fighting spirit would later make it very difficult to keep the Apaches on their designated reservations. The name Apache would strike fear into the hearts of the Mexicans, Spaniards, Anglos, and Pueblos. Legend maintained that an Apache warrior could run 50 miles without stopping. The Apache lived in dwellings called wickiups or wigwams, built from branches and animal hides or brush. An opening was left at the top of the dome-like structure 
to allow smoke from the interior fire pit to escape. The tribes were matriarchal and followed the mother's line. Strict codes of conduct were upheld within the group and men had to marry outside of their family group, and their mother loyalties would be placed with their mother-in-law. Medicine men led religious ceremonies. Beliefs included many spirit beings. Mount spirits were known as Gans, and Usun was the giver of life. When the Spanish arrived, both conflicts and trading followed. When the U.S. went to war with Mexico, the Apache allowed U.S. soldiers to cross their land, and they assisted in many ways. This peace lasted until the 1850s. Then came the Apache Wars, which were armed conflicts between the United States and bands of Apache tribes. One figure would become prominent during this time, and that would be a man history would come to know as Geronimo. Geronimo was born as Goyakla, meaning one who yawns, in 1829. He was born in the future state of New Mexico during a time of peace when the territory was under Mexican control. Apaches were not known to be farmers, but Geronimo's father was a farmer, and he taught his son agriculture. Geronimo wrote of this time, quote, We broke the ground with wooden hoes. We planted the corn in straight rows, the beans among the corn, and the melons and pumpkins in irregular order over the field, end quote. Geronimo also became an accomplished hunter and ate the heart of his first kill, as was the custom of his people. He also learned to raid as he became a teenager, and by the time he was 17, he had led four successful raids. He married his first wife, Alope, at this time, and they had three children together. And a lot of the Apaches' way of life dealt with raiding other Native American groups. And one of the reasons they did that, Denise, was because since they were basically hunters, if there wasn't a lot of buffalo or deer in the area, they would starve. And so that's why they would do a lot of the raiding they would do, because they needed something to eat. And so it wasn't necessarily that they were like, quote unquote, bad guys, They had some kind of reason behind it, but you still don't go stealing in order to eat. Right. Just because you're hungry, you don't get to go steal your neighbor's (laughs) food. Geronimo joined a group of his band on a peaceful trading mission in Janos, Mexico. While he was away, his family was ambushed by Mexicans. His mother, Juana, his wife, Alope, and all three of his children were killed. Geronimo wrote of the incident, quote, Late one afternoon, when returning from town, we were met by a few women and children who told us that Mexican troops from some other town had attacked our camp, killed all the warriors of the guard, captured all our ponies, secured our arms, destroyed our supplies, and killed many of our women and children. Quickly we separated, concealing ourselves as best as we could until nightfall, when we assembled at our appointed place of rendezvous, a thicket by the river. Silently we stole in, one by one, Sentinels were placed, and when all were counted, I found that my aged mother, my young wife, and my three small children were among the slain, end quote. So you can only imagine what he was feeling after he had basically gone on this peaceful mission into Mexico, and he comes back and finds out that his family has just been slaughtered. Well, I think any of us would go absolutely almost insane with rage. I know I would. And indeed, Geronimo did. And that's why we are going to see that he led the life that he did. So they took him from being a warrior who was basically raiding other groups into a warrior that would be killing lots and lots of people. He burned their home and belongings and went into the wilderness to grieve. Anger and a need for revenge consumed Geronimo and who could blame him. He wrote, I was never again contented in our quiet home. I had vowed vengeance upon the Mexican troopers who had wronged me, and whenever I saw anything to remind me of former happy days, my heart would ache for revenge upon Mexico. And the home that he burned was the home that they had lived in. I guess it was part of their custom to do that. It was during one of his attacks on the Mexicans that he earned the name we all know him by, and the call that many children cry as they jump into the water, or that U.S. paratroopers called as they jump from planes, and that is Geronimo. The term is Spanish for Jerome, and that was the name of a saint that the Mexicans looked to for protection. They called out for help from the saint as Geronimo bared down on them. So because everybody would hear them yelling, you know, Geronimo, Geronimo, they soon took that as they're yelling that that's who's coming to get them. And he took that as his name then. Geronimo came to be known as a man with no fear, and he claimed that he had none because of a voice he heard in his head that told him, no gun can ever kill you. I will take the bullets from the guns of the Mexicans so they will have nothing but powder, and I will guide your arrows. Geronimo attacked the Mexicans for 10 years. 
mining for precious metals like silver and gold brought settlers to Arizona, and they began to live on Apache land. This caused discourse and Apaches would raid and attack the settlements, resulting in the U.S. government sending soldiers to protect the settlers, and the Apache Wars ensued. Stagecoaches and wagon trains were regularly ambushed by the Apaches. Geronimo's father-in-law was an Apache leader named Cochise. He was weary of war and decided to make peace. This meant that the Apache would willingly go to a reservation set up on prime Apache real estate. After Cochise died, the U.S. government reneged on the agreement. Geronimo was deeply angered by this and resented that his people were being moved from the choice land so that settlers could move into the area. He was not going to go to the reservation, and he ran for the mountains of Mexico with a band of men in 1876. The government caught him in 1877 and sent him to the San Carlos Apache Reservation. And on this reservation, the conditions were horrid. They starved the people, forced them to do heavy labor. And some people may not have heard rumors of the military giving the Native American people smallpox and such, but this is one of the places that that happened. And there was a lot of disease there for them, so a lot of them died there. And not just gave it to them by, like, accidentally exposing them. They, like, sent blankets, so, correct, that were that were full of smallpox. So they did it purposely, not like a different type of people came in and they got it from them. They purposely sent it to them. Yes. He escaped that reservation in 1881. He was very good at doing this. He's going to do this many, many times where they would capture him and he would escape. Capture him, he would escape. The last of the Indian Wars took place over the next five years as Geronimo eluded authorities. 5,000 troops hunted him and 17 of his men And in that time, the legend of Geronimo grew through newspapers and word of mouth. The San Francisco Chronicle reported the surrender of Geronimo in their paper dated September 1, 1886. Geronimo now made overtours of peace to the Americans and made known his wish to surrender. He came in person to Captain Lawson's camp and said that he and his men were tired of the war and wanted to surrender, but he wanted to be assured that their lives would be spared. He had with him 21 bucks, 16 squaws, and some children. He told Captain Lawson that he was anxious for peace and wanted to see General Miles so that he could surrender to him. He said that he never wanted to go on the warpath, but that certain persons at the San Carlos Agency had made a plot to have him killed and that he would not give up his life without a struggle. It was interesting looking through the newspapers at the different writings that they would have about this certain time period. And they definitely would mark these people as savages and red men and was not very complimentary to them at first. But then as you start seeing them talk a little bit more about Geronimo, they would talk about his great feats and that he was bulletproof, that he could not be caught. But obviously at this point, he's been running for five years and he's had 5,000 men after him. And I think he just finally... He's got several wives and children with him. I think he was just getting tired of it. Well, and probably didn't want a repeat of what had happened to his first family. Exactly. But it is a symbol of his indomitable spirit that he was the last of his people to surrender. And it really was the Apache people that were the last to go on to the reservations and to surrender to the American government. They were really the last holdouts. And it was because of that indomitable spirit and that warrior spirit that they had. When he surrendered, he possessed a Winchester model 1876 lever action rifle with a silver washed barrel and receiver. Pretty nice gun there. Yes. A Colt single action army revolver with a nickel finish and ivory stocks. I want that one. Yeah, I bet you do. And a Sheffield Bowie knife with a dagger type blade and a stag handle made by George Wastenholm in an elaborate silver studded holster and cartridge belt. So he had some pretty nice weaponry there. It was at this time that he's going to be moved around quite a bit. He was sent first to a prison in Florida at Fort Pickens, and then a prison camp in Alabama named Mount Vernon Barracks. And again, this is a man who just wants to get his people back to the Southwest. He wants to go back to the Southwest. They tell him a lot of the time, yeah, we're going to do this. And as was the case time and time again with the U.S. government, regardless of who the Native American group was, They pretty much reneged on everything they ever gave them. And, you know, their reservations started to get smaller and smaller. They would move them to different areas. We've talked about the Trail of Tears on here before, Mm -hmm. Denise. And that was basically trying to push everybody past the Mississippi River and getting them away from the East Coast. So this is what Geronimo is getting a feel for is we're just going to keep moving you around to all these different places. It wasn't because he 
was getting away from him. They just kept moving him around. It was at Mount Vernon Barracks that he had his pregnant wife with them and one of their daughters, and he made a decision to have them returned to a reservation in New Mexico. So apparently they were free to go, but he wasn't. He would never see them again. He was finally sent to Fort Sill in Oklahoma. He spent 27 years as a prisoner of war, and most of that time was spent at Fort Sill. He was taken to the World Fair in St. Louis in 1904. He had figured out that he could make money from a celebrity. So this is when he's really going to start to become a celebrity. He already was kind of getting that status when he was on the run. But now when he's in captivity, he would have at least 20 visitors a day, sometimes more. And then this is when they started taking him around to a lot of these different places. And this is what was fun about him is that he figured out, wait a minute, these people are making money off of me at these fairs. So whenever my picture gets taken, they're making 25 cents or if I'm autographing stuff, they're making money. I need to be making some of this money. So for the pictures out of that 25 cents, he would get 10 cents. And for the autographs, he would get all the money and he would charge anywhere between 10 to 25 cents. And at that time, that's pretty good money. He would make around $2 a day. So not bad. Not bad at all. In 1905, Geronimo met with President Theodore Roosevelt. He hoped that he could convince the president to let his people return to the Southwest. And that's really interesting that even in captivity, even finding a new way, he still always, in the back of his warrior spirit, had that goal of returning his people. He really was an activist back in that time. When we think of our modern day activists, that's kind of what he was. You know, you have a lot of these celebrities who will get to be activists behind their certain cause. So that's kind of what he was doing here. He was using that celebrity. I mean, here he has an audience with the president. And he took that time to say, Mr. President, I'd really would love to get my people back to the Southwest, obviously, even though Theodore Roosevelt was more a man who would listen to that kind of thing and was more into the natural and stuff. No, he didn't do it. He would also plead with the reporters who visited him to help him in getting his people back to their home. He would say, quote, We are vanishing from the earth. The Apaches and their homes each were created for the other by Usan, the Apache life giver himself. When they are taken away from these homes, they sicken and die. How long will it be until it is said there are no Apaches? End quote. He lived in Oklahoma with his other wife and family. The Apache were a polygamous. In all, Geronimo had nine wives. When this wife died, he took care of the family doing the domestic chores. Imagine this great warrior who is rumored to have made a blanket from scalps. This wasn't true, by the way. Washing dishes and sweeping floors. (laughs) Yeah, I can't imagine. He's traded in his Winchester rifle for a broom. Who would have ever thunk it? A real man can do dishes, though. That's right. And he doted on his children and just adored and loved them very much. And I had no idea that the Apache were so polygamous. Nine wives, that's a lot. More than I want to handle. Yeah. <laughs> Not, no, 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 I didn't mean that bad, but like one's enough, you know, trying to like. <laughs> you better just it. stop digging yourself in a hole there. And moving right along, Diane. Geronimo died in 1909 after falling off his horse during a winter storm. He survived the night in the cold, but when he was found the next day, he was very ill. And uh, they believe that he ended up getting pneumonia from that. He passed away six days later. He told his nephew, who was at his side at the time, before he died, quote, I should never have surrendered. I should have fought until I was the last man alive, end quote. So you can almost see how they almost trapped his spirit there. And he realized that his spirit had been trapped and that he would have rather have died than to have gone on living this basically imprisoned celebrity type life. Geronimo was buried under a tombstone that's decorated with an eagle. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a rather large eagle. The life of Geronimo is a perfect symbol of the struggle between the U.S. government and the subjugation of the Native American people. A great warrior was turned into a crushed man selling his fame for money. Could this be the reason why his spirit seems to have remained even after his death? And one of the interesting things about the Apache spiritual beliefs when it comes to the afterlife is they weren't exactly sure what happens to you after, but it was almost like they believed that you would still have a life on earth. It wasn't necessarily based on reincarnation where you would have another life on earth, but it was, you'd almost go on living the same kind of life that you had here in the afterlife. So if you were a warrior here, you would be a warrior there. Your life would just kind of continue. It was almost like you had a blip on your screen and you just wouldn't still be here. 
He was rumored to have become a Christian later on, but then he would renounce some of those beliefs and say that he still held to the Apache way. So nobody knows for sure exactly where he stood when it came to spirituality. But it would seem that when it comes to the afterlife, he's still hanging around a bit. For 40 days in 1886, Geronimo was held prisoner at Fort Sam Houston. It was not a lengthy stay, but there are those who believe that they have seen the spirit of Geronimo on the base. Fort Pickens is haunted by several Native American spirits, and this was yet another place touched by Geronimo. Fort Sill in Oklahoma is a very haunted location, and in one of the buildings there is a Native American that haunts a closet. Could this be Geronimo? His spirit is seen and felt in many places at Fort Sill. And this is where he's buried. Mike wrote on the Ghosts of America website, I visited the Apache Cemetery on Fort Sill in October 2014, while there for my stepson's graduation from BCT. It was late in the afternoon, about one hour before sunset, when we arrived at the cemetery. As I went through the cemetery gates and walked along the gravel path leading to Geronimo's gravesite, there were three or four extremely cold spots on a really warm evening. Each spot required walking about six or eight feet to pass through it. My stepson, who was following me in military dress blue, said he could feel them too. We arrived at the grave of Geronimo and looked around. When we were ready to leave, I left a coin on his grave to show respect, as many before me had done. A total of 15 minutes had elapsed, and when we walked back out on the path, the cold spots were gone. So that's kind of interesting. Was it Geronimo? Who knows? But it was something on that path. Another comment was left by Jim, claiming that he had felt the spirit of Geronimo several times when he was at Fort Sell. Jeff wrote, quote, I also have seen the ghostly figure of Geronimo and he has a very ferocious and enraged look on his face. He seems to have some kind of grudge against someone or something. I fear this ghost will remain in the Fort Sill area until someone can put him in a piece of sorts. This man's ghost is in a rage, and I can't wait until I'm sent someplace else because it frightened me that much. Maybe some kind of sacred ritual will put him at ease, but I know nothing about such things as that, end quote. Many times, the apparition of Geronimo appears to be headless, and there's a reason why. The secret society, Skull and Bones, that is headquartered at Yale University, is rumored to have the skull of Geronimo on display in their house. There might be something to the rumor because Geronimo's kin sued the group in 2009 over the remains. The legend goes that members of the secret society, that included Prescott Bush, who is George W. Bush's grandfather, dug into the grave of Geronimo at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. This was during World War I, and they stole the man's skull and some of his bones. A letter written in 1918 seems to back up the claims. There's no real proof that this actually happened. It could just be fodder for conspiracy theorists, but it also could be a reason why Geronimo's spirit is at unrest. And since this is a secret society, Denise, they're very tight-lipped, and so no one will tell if they actually did do this and if this skull really does belong to Geronimo. But it is interesting that it was believed enough that it was an actual court case. I couldn't find anything about what the results of that was. I'm assuming that it was eventually thrown out of court because they couldn't get any proof of it. Or because many, many people who are very, very high up are part of Skull and Bones and very protective of it. Exactly. This is one of those groups that I looked into many years back. And, you know, you've got the Bushes were all, have all been members of Skull and Bones and our current Secretary of State, John Kerry, is a member. And yes, there's a lot of powerful people that have been a part of this group. So yeah, if they have something going on there with Geronimo Skull, we'll probably never know. And more than likely, it's not at their location at Yale University, which is basically like a crypt. It's probably been taken somewhere else. But yeah, they do all kinds of weird things there. When I was doing the uh, St. Charles Ghost Tour that you're going to get to go on here pretty soon, Yay. the Oddfellows building is there in their little downtown area. And that was one of the stories they tell about that one is there's a coffin that you have to get in there and it's part of their rituals and they used to have a real skeleton that was in the coffin and a lot of taboo like where did that skeleton come from and such so skull and bones is similar in that way just an interesting little side story that uh obviously geronimo's family's not very happy to have as a part of his legacy exactly and and no fear for any of our listeners diane and i do not have tinfoil on our heads at this point <laughs> Many New Age groups consider Geronimo to be an ascended master. 
He was a medicine man while on earth, and many believed that he could see the future. He also seemed to be bulletproof. Geronimo was a great warrior and an example of tenacity and perseverance. He also could be vicious and dangerous. His legend lives on in story, but could there be more than just legend? Could the spirit of Geronimo still walk the earth? Does Geronimo haunt various locations? That is for you to decide. Hey, we want to thank our listener, Jill Phoenix, for inspiring this because she had been talking about Fort Sam Houston and touring it and all the fun stuff there. And she said, yeah, and Geronimo supposedly haunts this location. And I was trying to think of, I wanted to do another Life and Afterlife show and I was trying to think of somebody and I went, oh, that would be very interesting. I thought I would find a lot more on the ghost of Geronimo, but it's very difficult to find it. But if you Google it, one of the main things that comes up, Denise, is a a Scooby-Doo show. (laughs) All righty then. So apparently the ghost of Geronimo is on uh, Scooby-Doo. Our next episode is going to feature Woodland Cemetery and Arbitorium. And this was suggested by our listener, Angie Lucent. So we're looking forward to bringing you that. And before we end the show, we do want to share with you a couple of reviews from iTunes. We've got Sladegar, five stars, historically spooky and personally charming. I love the great work you wonderful ladies do with the broad scope and great content. You always leave me wanting more, and I look forward to every new episode. Well, thanks so much, Sladegar. We appreciate that. And Jedi Fish, love it, five stars, great podcast, two of my favorite things, history and the paranormal, great hosts and great content. We want to thank you guys for listening to this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode was brought to you by our executive producers. Thanks. Have a spooky experience that occurred at an historic location? Want to give us feedback or have a suggestion for the show? Share it with us at historygoesbump at gmail.com. Societies rise and societies fall. When the time comes, one society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library, Kettle Whistle Radio, Night Story Podcast, Prog Watch, Red Horse Radio, The Lift, History Goes Bump. Listen, the M Writing Podcast, Society 13, Rebuilding Society, one podcast at a time.